and focus for this morning. Our focus song this morning is the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's go. 
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Willow Creek this morning. We're glad you chose to worship with us. Just a quick reminder that the plates are still on the center table in the back of the sanctuary for tithes and offerings if you feel so led. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious, beautiful, sunshiny, warm day, Lord. I thank you for the fact that even though I hate warm weather, you still send it because it's good for me. It's good for the plants. It's good for nature. Lord, we celebrate and worship and honor you for all of the things that you do for us, all of the things that you give to us, the things that we don't recognize, Lord, the blessings you pour out, both large and small, that we have our eyes closed to, our hearts closed to, and our minds closed to. We pray this morning that you would let this service be a blessing. Help us to open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, and our minds, Lord. And let this service bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And good morning to you. Not only to you that are in the pews, but to you that are out there in your PJs. Good morning to you. If you are watching out there in your PJs, make a comment, you know, and it'll get relayed to me, and I can say hi to you. This song that we are going to sing has this line, The Steadfast Love of the Lord. That sounds like words that I've heard from the Psalms. From the Psalms to the Gospels, it's the truth that Jesus loves even me. So why don't we stand and let's celebrate by singing it. Well, what name is that? Let me read from Revelation chapter 2, 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. My goodness gracious, what a name we're all going to have. Let us sing, He Knows My Name.
great response to that great love when he hears us when we call and knows our name he knows every thought in great response let us live in faith let us work let us pray let us sing praises let us sing i'm gonna live Say hello and to the people in the virtual world. Hello. <laughs> Roy's pointing at something. I'm not sure what he's pointing at. Oh, my balloon that's still up in the air. Yes, my balloon is still up in the air. Because Jesus hasn't come back yet. Yeah. He's still That's, smiling, though. He is still smiling. Mr. Roy, I might need your help for just a second. I seem to have lost what I had on your phone. Technical difficulties. Uno momento. Hey, these things that I'm wearing, they're called preaching bands, and I'll explain that just a little bit later when we have sharing time. You know, I'm just kind of, here comes Ruth, okay? And so I was going to just m meander a little bit more there. but Out there in TV land, I apologize. That was technical difficulties. Those folks in the sanctuary realized that. In lieu of children's message this morning, we are going to do graduate recognition. Um, we do have two graduates that were turned in that are going to be recognized this morning. If you are a graduate or have a graduate out there in TV land and you'd like to send a quick message, Robbie will shout it down to me and I'll give a shout out this morning, okay? I'm going to read a quick poem um, and I think it's very appropriate. Although I have to say, the lines in that last song we sang are pretty appropriate for graduates too. Live so God can use you. Work so God can use you, pray so God can use you, and sing so God can use you. I think those are pretty appropriate words for those graduating this year. What do, what do you think? Amen. So the poem I'm going to read is by Mother Teresa. Pretty appropriate for church. Do it anyway. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will have some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build it anyway. 
If you find serenity and happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will, people will often forget by tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It has never been between you and humans anyway. Always remember to keep God first in your life as you graduate and move out into the world. Um, we have, as I said, two graduates to recognize this morning. The first is a high school graduate who isn't here with us, but I'm going to ask his grandmother to come up and take his gift bag to him. The church did get small gifts um, for our graduates. So Colin Caldwell is graduating from Penn High School. I cannot believe that Colin's graduating from high school. <laughs> But you're old, Grandma. I'm not old. <laughs> so in Colin's gift bag, there's a journal. There is a daily devotional. There's some candy and chocolates. There's a little gift card to get a treat for himself for graduating. Um, and we just want to tell Colin, if you could pass it along, for those who won't be able to make his open house, that his Willow Creek family loves him. He will always be a part of us. Thank you. So, yeah, absolutely. I want to tell you, this he's my first, and for some of you grandmas out there, you've already been through it, and you know. And with COVID, they did have it in Penn uh, football field, so the parents were able to go. And when you're from a split family, they allowed both parents and the steps to go. Okay. Um, I thought a step should step aside and let Nana go, but that's just me. <laughs> but when they play Pomp and Circumstance... My heart just sank because from the moment he came into this world, I was there. And now is when it begins. His life begins. He went to Career Center in Elkhart through Penn, what a beautiful program Penn has. And they try to set up interviews for them. And Colin got called for an interview, and he's going to work for his first day as an adult tomorrow morning. Um, for a siding company, and the project he's doing is in Cassopolis, so he has to be there at 6 a.m. <laughs> and if you don't know Colin, he never knew what 6 a.m. was. So <laughs> I am asking for some prayers for traveling and prayers for just get him through the first week and let him get into a routine. But, you know, he's starting as an adult tomorrow. Praise God. And Miss Diane mentioned the COVID and how that's impacted everybody's life, and that's had a double impact on our other graduate who's going to get recognized this morning. Miss Haley Nemeth, who is a part of our church family, a part of our Willow Creek family, graduated in 2020 from IUSB with a bachelor's in fine arts and had to wait a whole year to be able to come and get her lovely gift from us because we weren't in church, in sanctuary back when Haley graduated. So Ms. Haley, would you please come up? Give Haley a round of applause. Congratulations. This is yours. You may take the mic. <laughs> um, when I graduated high school, it was 2016 and I was freshly 18, um, I already knew that I wanted to go to college, so I went to college right away, and I didn't want to leave the state um, for multiple reasons. So I stayed in Indiana, I went to IUSB, and I got my bachelor's degree in fine arts, concentrated in photography, and I've been doing photography since I was uh, 12 years old, now I just can put a professional label on it. Yeah. So um, I'm grateful for all the opportunities I've had. I'm grateful for being able to go to college, and a lot of people aren't able to experience that. Um, during this time of graduation last year, COVID impacted me because we were not able to walk the stage. And then we had another separate graduation for 2020 and 2021, but the only thing was, um, 
family and friends were not allowed to come. It was just the people who graduated, so I opted out of that. Um, and I'm just celebrating in spirit for all of this. Uh, and again, thank you guys for supporting me. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. Robbie, did you get anybody who came across the screen this morning? No? Well, to all you graduates out there in TV land, we say congratulations to you as well. Hey, Ruth. Hey, Carson Brown. Did you say that there were, uh, was candy in one of those bags? I graduated from, from the month of May into June. Hey, for those of you that are at home, you know, with your coffee and your treats, we got coffee and treats here, too, all right? Just so you know, all right? Special cupcakes back there today. <clears throat> anyway, my, my new adornment, uh, they are called preaching bands, and if we have that picture of John Wesley, so you'll see that John Wesley always wore preaching bands. And a lot of other preachers back in his day did. And today, too, as a matter of fact. But I was running across, and I stumbled upon these, and I thought that would be cool. And uh, particularly, it was a secondary thought, but particularly because June 28th of this month, <laughs> June 28th of this month, talk about redundant, um, is John Wesley's the, the anniversary of his birthday. And so in great recognition of John Wesley, in great recognition of, of uh, tradition and uh, trying to bring a, a little bit more of umph to um, Communion Sunday preaching bands this morning. What celebrations do you folks have this morning? Nobody's celebrating anything because, you know, we're overflowed, you know, with uh, graduate celebrations, you know, and we're, we're still in that. And Vicky's got something. The grandkids and that they, yeah, that they enjoy swimming and staying cool and cool. Yeah. As usual, the singing and the your singing is lovely. And as usual, the acrobatic fingers across the keys of the piano is uh, is is impressive. And yes, I put some humor in that. But God receives all of that like praise, like real praise. And, and when, we, when we celebrate these graduates and we, when we celebrate anything that's going on in your life, we're praising God. Because God made us for this kind of stuff. He made us for a relationship with each other and with him. And for all this fun stuff that we come up with. And so when we praise each other, we're praising God. Uh, Ruth has a celebration. I, uh, I did the cake and cupcakes for a wedding yesterday that took place in Culver, Indiana, um, to a wonderful, dear friend of mine. She's a nurse who um, spent a lifetime in a really bad marriage and a horrible relationship, and uh, she found the love of her life, and they got married on a beautiful lake yesterday. So congratulations to Amy and Dave. Congratulations to Amy and Dave that got married yesterday, and I guess Ruth did the cupcakes. So I guess she's going to start a second business or something doing cupcakes. Amy and Dave. Amy and Dave, congratulations to you. Anything else? We have a lot of things to be thankful for, and we could start naming them, and that's how you feel. It's like, well, where do I begin, and then where would I end? And since we know that, and since because Jesus is the beginning and the end of all things, why don't we stand and let us give thanks? It is a good and it is a rightful thing that we give praise to God. You may be seated, by the way. 
It is a good and it is a rightful thing that because we know that God loves even me, God loves even you, that his ears are open, his arms are open, he's all eager to hear what you might have to say. When your kids got home from school, you were just eager to hear a report from them of how it went. And then when they came home and they started saying, it didn't go well today, and it didn't go well today, and the next day, and then, you know, your kids were coming home, you know, it was like, it's not going well today. But you are still all open arms for them. God is still all open arms for us. Vicki brings forward, uh, Jean goes to the heart doctor tomorrow. Tomorrow. So we're going to be praying for Jean. Um, Vicki goes to the foot doctor on Tuesday. We're going to be praying for Vicki. We're going to pray for whoever has to take care of that pool for the kids. There you go. There you go. What? Molly, you got a prayer? Molly's praying that winter comes soon. Affirmed and confirmed by Ruth. And believe me, it will come all too soon. Uh, Rich had an amputation to to uh, some degree his foot. Rich, we're praying. We're praying for Rich. Um, uh, I just don't know how to, you know, if it were me, I don't know how I would deal with all that, you know. But but we're praying, and he's in good spirits and he's doing well, right? Uh, got a good attitude. So, Rich, if you're hearing, you know, we're praying for you, and you know. You're, you're impressive, okay? What else? That's a prayer for my Uncle Jack and Aunt Jenny. Jack and Jenny? My Uncle Jack suffers from Alzheimer's disease. Um, and until about a month ago, my Aunt Jenny had been able to handle him at home. But he's, uh, he's about seven years into the process now, and she finally had to place him. And she's having a really hard time. Jack is uh, going to be in a new facility. And Jenny is having difficulty with, with that. And I've been pastoring a good number of years, and I've run into a lot of situations of that. And it's just not ever easy. Uh, when when the, the, the guardian, the, the one that's taking care, has to make the decision to put a spouse or a parent uh, in a facility, there's just an awful lot of emotion that goes on there. But if you, if you in the sanctuary or out there are that person that has, has the responsibility, the loving responsibility of putting somebody, you know, someplace where they can be cared for, you know, know that you're just doing the right thing and you're doing the loving thing and you're just, oh, our hearts are with you, okay, for sure. Anything else? As I pray, I'm not going to conclude with the Lord's Prayer because I'm going to do that during, during the communion aspect of our service today. And if I do happen to forget, Ruth over here is going to like grab my ear, you know, and, and, and remind me, okay? And so let's take time for prayer. Our Lord, our posture this morning within our hearts is kneeling. Our posture this morning is that we have our hands over our heart. Our posture this morning, Lord, is that we have open palms lifting up to you. Our posture this morning, Lord, is that in all that we say and all that we do, we praise and honor you for sure. But Lord, because we know that you love even us, we know that you are eager to hear what we bring to you. We bring to you this morning, Lord, a request for care and healing for Jane, a request and care for, for the improvement for Vicki. We bring to you, Lord, your presence and your reassurance to Jenny. And we pray, Lord, that you would you know, pr provide a sense of comfort. 
Lord, we pray for these graduates that as they make these next decisions in life and they go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, Lord, that you would be with them and protect them, that you would protect them in the workplace, Lord, and that you would protect them in their decision-making as to what to do next in life. Lord, we come before you because so many of us in the sanctuary, we look back over our lives and we know that we've made so many of those decisions and we know, Lord, that you have brought us along. But, Lord, we don't know, even us, we don't know where we're going next. And so, Lord, we are all in the same boat. We are all in this same boat of uncertainty. We are all in this same boat of wanting to praise you, to work for you, to sing for you, to pray. Lord, we are all in this same boat of wanting to live our lives for you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would heal those that have had surgery and foot amputations. We would pray, Lord, that you would get them back to doing the things that they enjoyed doing in life, perhaps hunting, perhaps whatever it may be, Lord. Lord, you are the great healer. You are the great person. You are the great God, sovereign God, that can attend to all of these things and all of these people named and well, well, well beyond all of that. It is a world in turmoil, Lord. Cause us as Christians to reach out and to bring other people into this club that we call Christianity, into this club that we call church, Lord, because we know, Lord, that like herd immunity, the more Christians we get on this planet, the more it displaces the evil that is in this planet. And so, Lord, we would pray that you would be with us, that you would enable us, enlighten us, heal us all, Lord. Every one of us, whether we've mentioned a prayer request or not, you know that in our hearts there is something to attend to. We open our hearts, we invite you in, we invite you into those dark places that we don't even want to visit ourselves. We ask that you would heal us, to forgive us, to lift us up, Lord, to make us your servants. We will live for you, Lord, as you enable us to do so. We pray these things, each and every one of us in this sanctuary and each person that is watching at home, we pray from the bottoms of our hearts. Amen. has a scripture for us this morning that does not have any hard words in it. I'm breaking into the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you and by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. We, as human beings, become numb even to the things that we love over time. We get hooked on a TV show, a song, a color, a flavor, and over the course of time we become like, yeah, it's all right just looking for something new. And I know that we all know that God loves us, but I suspect that we don't grasp just how deeply it is that God loves us. And so the point to today's sermon is to rediscover our infatuation with God and to know just a bit deeper just how much it is that God loves us. By golly, he sits around and thinks about us all the time. That's infatuation. Yes, so often we see the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross as evidence of love. But today I submit that God's love for, re for us reaches even deeper than that. God's love for us is so extraordinarily unaccountable, even angels 
are puzzled and perplexed. As I go through this sermon, I will pull from some different uh, books of the Bible, and so I, I always have to like say, when you do that, you have to be careful to make sure that your context is faithful. And I believe that my context is faithful. I'm not trying to develop any new doctrine for you. I'm just trying to show evidence that God loves you. Let us not be numb to that fact. Let us never go, yeah, I know God loves me. Concerning this salvation, as Ruth spoke, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come searched intently with the greatest care to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It's a long, complicated sentence. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? Man, like, you all thought that I had long, complicated sentences. But anyway... As uh, Bible scholar David Bartlett says, no critical Bible scholar is likely to be satisfied with Peter's description of prophecy. And while I value, I, I value the academic work of Bible scholars, we have to say, who knows better in this situation, the Bible scholar or Peter that spoke it, right? Peter was with Jesus. This is what I told you, Jesus said, that while I was with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Basically, what Peter is saying is that the pointing to Jesus was back there. And those prophets and all that were writing about it, they may not have grasped it at the moment. They were doing the best that they could under the circumstances, but they knew that they were looking and pointing towards something beyond their present moment. And so Jesus opened their minds to understand. So allow me to paraphrase Peter regarding our salvation or restoration, which was the word he used, the prophets, those sent by God with great intent, searched, directed by the Spirit of Christ, to, it was not yet to arrive. They are talking about salvation. Unmerited, undeserved, and even unasked for grace. As I had a discussion with somebody earlier today, how you doing? And that person said, better than I deserve. And I suppose that's true. But by God. Golly, what Jesus wants to give us. This is a seriously big deal. I know that we're, you know, thousands of times, you know, we don't deserve God's grace, and yet he initiated an outpouring of it and continues that outpouring. I affirm that our actions and our intentions condemn us such that we don't deserve grace. But being born into this sinful reality, we can't help but fall short. But I think it goes much deeper than that. I think this exercise of grace initiated by God is a singularly unique event in all of the history of created reality. God is infatuated with us. This grace is so singular and unique, it baffles even the angels. So let me set the stage here for a moment. There will be hell to pay. All right? Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called <laughs> devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And to add a bit of clarification as to where Satan was cast from Jude... We read, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, there he has kept them in darkness bound with everlasting chains until the judgment day. God does not mess around. For disobedience there will be hell to pay. That is the reality, and the angels know that reality. Angels are pretty bright. They see things and know things we don't. They are in the room, so to speak, with God. As it says in the book of Job, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. The reality of existence as an angel is this. You don't get a second chance. 
The reality of angels is this. You don't get a second chance. You cracked the egg and you cannot put it back together. And yet, to those disobedient, self-serving, ignorant humans who moment by moment depend upon the will of God even for the air that we breathe, God extends this unaccountable, extravagant, bewildering grace. This grace was previously unknown, unpredictable, and incomprehensible to angels. Our tech crew, if any time when you can, if you want to pull up that picture of the Last Supper. Hey, it's up. Eve, Peter says, even angels long to look into these things. Ray Pritchard of Be Keep Believing Ministry says, it means to stand on tiptoe as if you're at the back of a crowd trying to reach, you know, a, of a parade and trying to see what's ahead of you. The angels are at the back of the crowd. Why should the angels marvel at our salvation? The answer is clear. There are no saved angels because salvation is not for them. But for us, Jesus died to redeem, redeem fallen men and women, not angels. There are elect and non-elect angels, disobedient and obedient angels, good angels and bad angels. But there are no saved angels. Restoration is created and offered to those who are made in the image of God. This fascinates the angels and it causes them to study and ponder the mysteries of a salvation that they can never share in. Here is Peter's message made plain. God loves you so much the angels are amazed. They know nothing about grace and mercy and forgiveness. They've never experienced new life, new birth, regeneration, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They've never experienced the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the wonder of deliverance from sin. That which we experience in Jesus Christ, the angels will never know by far. You are more privileged than the divine beings that are called angels. So this picture of the Last Supper, this was done by the artist Tintoretto, who lived in Italy during the 1500s, and I prefer this one over uh, Da Vinci's, and I know Da Vinci's picture has got more color to it, you know, and everything, but Da Vinci's picture looks very, very posed, you know? It looks like somebody, you know, says, hey, I, I, let's do a picture, and they get the photographer, and, and they pose it. This one looks very, very candid, as if somebody just happened to be in there and snapped a photo of that in the moment. At the top there, and it may be difficult for you to see, but in this picture we have, we have angels floating around up there looking on to see what's going on at this Last Supper here because they kind of have an idea of what may happen, but they don't know for sure. All they have known is when you are disobedient, you're done. And yet they witness this unique, wondrous love. I imagine those angels there, like being on the edge of your seat at a suspenseful movie, thinking, how is this going to end? When Sherry says that to me when we're watching TV or, or a movie or something, I always quip, good script writers. I thought I'd get a chuckle. God's a good script writer, wouldn't you think? Anyway, I have not had the opportunity to interview an angel. I grant that. I can't ask them any questions. But I am sure that they are, like, really super baffled. If I were an angel, I would be envious. I would be jealous, perhaps even insulted. From Psalm 8, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You made them a little lower than the angels and then crowned them with glory and honor. Let me, let me read it as if the angels heard that and were responding. Okay? What is man that you are mindful of those disobedient evil ones, human beings that you care for murderers, for coveters, 
for gossipers. You've made them a little lower than us, and then you crowned them, undeserving as they are, with the glory and with honor. Let's grasp at this just a little bit more, okay? Why these angels really, really are jealous and envious of you, all right? Genesis 3, you will surely not die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat, you know, it from your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent tempts Eve with the temptation that he himself has. And he wants Eve and Adam to fail and all of us to fail because it's like that fifth grade childish kind of thing. Well, if I can't have it, nobody's going to have it. And then Jesus comes forth out of the grave, defeating Satan and death, and claims us as brothers and sisters, not as servants, not as underlings, but as brothers and sisters. Us who don't deserve it. Now that is indeed singularly unique. Another point for the angels to be jealous about. May we never become so numb to the depth and the height of God's love for us. Whatever failings we may have, Jesus redeems us because Jesus is infatuated with you. Whatever condition of sin we bear, Jesus chooses us to live, to work, to pray, to sing. Folks, if you are good enough for Jesus, you know, born of a virgin, had a ministry, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried, rose from the grave and ascended. If you're good enough for him, don't ever let any human being tell you that you're not. Not even yourself. As we move into our communion time this morning, I remind you that it was Jesus. Let me move over here. It was Jesus that at that last supper said, you know, I'm going to be the sacrifice for you. And I'm paraphrasing Jesus an awful lot here. But those disciples that sat around would have known what he was talking about when he said, my brothers and sisters. This is my body broken for you. They would have understood the sacrificial symbolism of that. And as he continued and completed the the meal, this is my blood poured for you for the forgiveness of sins of many. For the forgiveness of sins of many. And all you have to do is ask for it. That's it. He is right. He is just and faithful to forgive. It is Jesus that offers this this morning, just as he offered it to his disciples that were at the table with him. The big thing is, while he was at the table with them, he had much of the suffering that he had to look forward to. And today, he has only glory to look forward to. He has our glory to look forward to. And so it is, as we take a moment to invite the Holy Spirit to bless these elements this morning, that they become the body and the blood of Jesus, that I invite you to humble yourselves. Our Lord, we ask that you take these elements, that you bless them by the power of the Holy Spirit to make them for us the sacrificial, forgiving glory of Jesus that we share with each other and with you this morning. Lord, we do this in memory of you. We do this in full reconciliation of one to another brother and sister those that are in the room and those that may not be in the room lord we do this in great reconciliation of those with whom we may be angry with those that have harmed us with those that we have harmed lord we have not stepped forward to seek an apology or to apologize to them but lord we lift it to you we lift it to you 
And through your grace and through your mercy and through your sovereign power, we ask that you reconcile us. Reconcile all of us to whoever we may be angry with. Reconcile all of us to whoever we may have envy of. Reconcile us, Lord, such that Satan has absolutely no room in our hearts whatsoever this morning. And Lord, we do this because we rely upon the power of your love and your grace and the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite our <coughs> communion stewards to come forward this morning. Those of you that may be at home, I know it's a little late for me to invite, but if you've got something at home that can be used as, as uh, elements, it is the Holy Spirit that blesses them. It is the Holy Spirit that transforms them. And you're invited to share communion with us this morning. Ruth? I will. The body of our Lord and Savior broken for you. The body of our Lord and Savior broken for you. I invite any and all of you to come forward to this unaccountable forgiveness, this unimaginable status with Jesus as he calls us brothers and sisters. Come forward for this communion. Angels long to look into these things. Angels long to look into these things. Angels long to look into these things. The glory of Jesus. He has given us new birth into a living hope. Through his resurrection from the dead. He has given us new birth into inheritance that can never perish, spoil the faith. In this we greatly rejoice, even though we suffer grief and trials, we have genuine faith. We are filled with joy, we love Him, we believe in Him, we believe in Him, even though we have not seen Him. We are receiving the hope of our faith. Angels long to look into these things. Angels long to look into these things. Angels long to look into these things. The glory of Jesus. The prophets intently searched, searched with the greatest care to find the time when Christ would come. It was not revealed to those who were searching. But now we know the glory of the Son. Concerning this salvation, the grace that has come to us, praise God, the mystery's been revealed. We are filled with joy, we love Him, we believe in Him, and angels long to look into these joy inexpressible and glorious. Angels long to look into these things. Long to look into these things. Angels long to look into.
closing song and please stand as we sing our benediction song which is the chorus of Jesus loves even me <coughs> indeed blessed you and you don't know the depth of that blessing yet until you get out into the world there and show your love to somebody and see how deep that love is and see how long it lasts and see how wherever it's going to go you have been blessed you have been blessed in mysterious ways you have been blessed in unaccountably imaginable ways you have been blessed in ways that continue to make those angels envious so feel good about yourself I leave you in peace announcements this morning, I would like to remind everyone that this coming Saturday, beginning at 8 a.m., is a work day. We are going to plan to do a lot of outside work to start getting things ready for